Okay, good morning and good evening, everyone. Um, to welcome to the second in series um, of the uh, research talks that uh, that are being organized jointly by the Pathcheck Foundation and uh, and Tav Lab at IIIT Delhi. Um, we are very excited to have another three set of extraordinary accomplished speakers who will be talking to us about their work in the pandemic, um, starting from genomics um, into imaging and also uh, into machine learning. So our first speaker of the day is uh, uh, Dr. Chitra. So Chitra is a virologist and a molecular biologist uh, who uses genomics tools uh, to identify pathogens in brain infections. So Chitra is a fellow of uh, the Wellcome Trust DBT India Alliance, which is a very, very prestigious fellowship. Uh, she's an early career fellow at the, um, at, at the Department of Neurovirology at Nimhans Bangalore. And she's interested in all things viral, especially if they are novel, emerging, and they cause human disease. Chitra um, obtained her BSc in microbiology from Calcutta University and an integrated MSc PhD in the life science from National Center for Biological Sciences, TIFR Bangalore. Chitra has also been awarded the SERB Royal Society Newton International Fellowship for postdoctoral work at, um, um, at the University of Liverpool. So I also had the chance to listen to Chitra in, at the recent Sun, um, 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 uh, Sun Pharma Awards. Uh, which was being chaired by Professor Shai Jamil, who was our previous speaker. And I, I'm very much excited to, uh, to hear your work, Chitra. Uh, uh, we would love to know about your work in the pandemic on viral sequences. All over to you. Please go ahead and start presenting. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction and thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm excited to be here and to talk about uh, our work on sequencing SARS-CoV-2. So I'm going to talk about uh, importation, circulation, and emergence of variants of SARS-CoV-2 in India. So it's going to be sort of in the Indian context, but I think it's sort of uh, what we find in India is also globally relevant. Um, so just to jump into the talk. Um, so this is, the, this is sort of a diagrammatic sketch of what SARS-CoV-2, which is a coronavirus, looks like. So if you look at the genome of this virus, it's around 30,000 base pairs in length. So those are the letters that code for all the proteins that make up uh, this virus and give it all its properties. And uh, what you see here in red is this protein called the spike protein. And I want to draw your attention to that because that is the protein that sort of uh, binds with uh, the ACE2 receptor on human cells. So this is important for the biological function, um, particularly for uh, entering the cells. And uh, then there are other structural genes towards the end of the genome. So this is the SARS-CoV-2 genome. And uh, very early on in the pandemic, uh, between December 2019 to April 2020, we already knew that the genome was changing. And uh, roughly, this virus was acquiring mutations at the rate of uh, about one uh, change every two weeks. So um, where were these changes ha happening? So this is a diagrammatic sketch of the regions of the genome and uh, where you find uh, the changes or the mutations. So the longer lines represent uh, places in the genome which are more tolerant to mutations, what we would call a hotspot. And um, there are some places which don't tolerate mutations well as well. But you can see here in the spike protein, it's actually fairly tolerant to changes. And this becomes more important as we move uh, into this part of the pandemic where uh, the virus is throughout the world and there are a lot of naive hosts and we're not able to stop transmission chains as quickly as we would like. So that was the situation uh, in April last year. So what does it look like now? So I have just pulled out the data of uh, what the mutation hotspots in the virus look like now. And you can see, so this is an inverted uh, graph. So you can see that the sort of regions of hotspot are approximately the same. And so the virus in its properties and its ability to acquire mutations has not changed, um, what, but we, it has accumulated more mutations. And that brings us to this idea of variants. So um, I would like to talk to you a little bit about what, what are SARS-CoV-2 lineages and what are SARS-CoV-2 variants. So, um, 
basically all these changes uh, can define the virus. So um, we would call it uh, any, once the virus acquires a mutation from its sort of parent lineage, the one that started in Wuhan in China, um, all of the viruses that are descendants of that viruses are, will, can form uh, lineages. So for example, here, uh, a, a lineage is basically defined as viruses that cluster together. So they form a phylogenetic cluster. They're also epidemiologically linked. So you know that in an outbreak or starting from the same source, these are the viruses that are related to each other. And also um, in, some, in, in some sense, the lineage also reflects the hierarchy of the viruses. For example, um, and I will go over this again, the ancestral virus uh, has been called A, lineage A. And so there are two sort of ancestral uh, lineages, A and B, and all other lineages in circulation actually have an ancestor in A or B. And the way that this sort of nomenclature progresses is that all the descendants of B get called B.1. Um, and then all the descendants of B.1 are labeled B.1.1 and so on. And after the sort of third level, uh, you zero back in and call it a different letter. So that's why you have P1 and F1 and so on. Um, the good thing about this system of nomenclature is that it captures the leading edge of the pandemic, which means that if you have a C1, you know that this is a sort of more recent uh, lineage than A. Um, so this is what the SARS-CoV-2 lineages of interest or concern uh, look like. So all lineages uh, start with A, and we know that um, A has acquired some changes very early on in the pandemic, and uh, B uh, is actually the dominant lineage. There are few viruses from the A lineage also circulating, and um, from B, we have B.1, and we also have some others. I will talk to you about B.6, which is quite dominant in India. And some of the A lineages are still circulating, like A.2, 3.1. And some of these have got some uh, mutations in the spike protein, uh, which experiments in the lab uh, show that they can, um, they're associated with increased transmissibility or infectivity in cell culture. Um, some of them are also um, associated with a decrease in neutralization by antibodies. What that means is uh, if a person has been infected uh, with SARS-CoV-2 of a different lineage before and has made antibodies towards the virus, they don't seem to work as well when this mutation is present. Um, that doesn't mean they're completely useless. Uh, it just or that we cannot mount an adequate immune response. We don't have enough evidence for that, uh, but we do know that there is a decline uh, in the immune response as measured by antibodies. So very early on in the pandemic, there was one particular mutation in the spike protein called DG614. And this change, this mutation got fixed in the population. Most of the viruses that are circulating now belong to the B.1 lineage. So everything that you'll see will be like B.1 point something. And the most sort of uh, notorious lineage right now is the one here, which is B.1.7, also known as the UK variant, which carries two mutations in the spike protein and also B.1.351, which was in South Africa, which again has two mutations in the spike protein, as well as uh, P.1, which, is, uh, which was first found in Brazil, when they found a, uh, in an area of high seroprevalence, they started seeing SARS-CoV-2 back again. So B.1.7, which is the UK variant, um, there is good evidence now that it, is, it has increased transmission uh, it seems to be taking over in many places, uh, including parts of the US now. B.1.351, which was first seen in South Africa, um, we know has got an immune escape phenotype in in vitro uh, lab experiments. And there seems to be a decline in vaccine efficacy associated with this, although we need to do more experiments to know better. And P.1, which actually belongs, is a descendant of this lineage here, that one is uh, associated with reinfection. And uh, overall, we are concerned about uh, variants that have these kinds of properties, that is increased transmission, immune escape, reinfection, increased disease se severity. And the reason we are concerned is that they increase the disease burden and uh, we will not be able to stop the pandemic. It's more like in places like India, we expect that the second wave um, 
might have something to do with variants. However, the sort of focus, um, so just before I go into that, so this is the sort of um, picture of the three variants that I mentioned before, which is the UK variant, the one that was found in Brazil first, the P.1, and then this one was first found in South Africa, this P.1.351. And uh, there is now reasonable evidence that there is a decrease in uh, vaccine efficacy, although how that is defined and what that will mean for a population is not clear because it's not just the antibodies. You make a lot of different kinds of immune response. So we'll have to see, um, but this, this is a cause for concern. That's why these variants have been called variants of concern. And once they emerge, they seem to be spreading quite quickly. So this is uh, the spread of the, um, uh, the B.1.1.7 or the UK variant as it is called and how quickly it came to other parts of the world. So we detected it in India like close to Christmas. So uh, it was noted by November, uh, we knew that it was spreading quite a bit in the UK and was becoming a dominant uh, variant there, but very quickly we started seeing it in all parts of the world. So this is sort of uh, by time and you can see it, the spread was quite quick. Uh, so this is also a cause for concern that even with restricted travel, variants that emerge in one part of the world are still getting to other parts. Um, but we are also concerned about variants that emerge locally. So what we know from the stories from uh, UK, Brazil, and South Africa is that if you look, it is likely that you will see that there are local variants uh, and it is important to look at their properties as well. So we started looking at what's happening in India. So this is, uh, uh, this is the number of sequences from India, as you can see, that's a quite small number compared to the global uh, sequences. A lot of this is from Australia and the UK. Um, in India, there are 138 lineages of SARS-CoV-2 circulating, whereas globally you have more than 800. There seems to be some local uh, effect in the sense that there are some lineages that are circulating locally and not globally. Uh, these are the top 10 lineages uh, in India. So B.1.36, uh, is the lineage that I think is sort of top right now. And this one, B.1.1.1.306 is a uniquely Indian lineage. It has, it is found in other places now, but uh, the root is in India. And B.1 is a parent lineage. So most viruses uh, that don't have a lineage yet get clustered into that. And these, um, what you see on the right-hand side here are in, um, in vitro. So these are mutations in the virus that have been uh, seen in in vitro experiments. So basically, if you grow the virus uh, under some selection conditions, like with an antibody, and look for the mutations that help it escape that antibody, uh, you come up with these kinds of uh, mutations. So you can see here um, E484Q. This is a change that is present in the South African variant. And uh, yeah, so uh, this one we think is a major immune escape a mutation. But the one that we see a lot in India and which is a cause of concern is N440K. Uh, and we haven't looked at how vaccines respond to this one. And so these are the different states in India. And uh, what we see is that in, um, viruses with these mutations associated with immune escape are already circulating in India. And um, I just wanted to show you some local variants. Uh, so it's not just uh, so how does a variant become a variant of concern? Uh, so these are right now just variants circulating and we'll need to do experiments to see if they are variants of concern. So this one is, uh, this is a variant that's dominant in Maharashtra, which is a state in India. And uh, of all the sequence genomes, which is in blue here, uh, the orange ones you see are B.1.1.306. This is a major lineage. It was seen in Asia and in India first. And then now it's seen in North America as well. So a lot of lineages of SARS-CoV-2 have been going across the world. It's not just the variants of concern. So they can emerge anywhere. Uh, that is the real point that I want to make with this. And uh, I wanted to contrast these two lineages, B.1.36 and B.6. Uh, both of these are uh, in Delhi, which is um, in the north of India. Both of these lineages are the top lineages of all the sequence genomes. But sequencing in India has been a bit, um, like we haven't been sequencing intensely and throughout the pandemic. So since September 2020, we don't have good representation for Delhi. Uh, but in that time, you can see that B.6 actually stopped somewhere around June. 
uh, we know that there was a super spreader event. Um, and uh, I will show you data from Bangalore that correlates uh, with this as well. And then V.1.36 seems to be a major uh, lineage since then. And we need to know more. We need to sequence more. We don't know what the current scenario is. Um, and all throughout the world, if you look at global data, you start seeing V.1.36 uh, in Europe uh, around August, but it was already present in Asia um, in May and June. And so this is a lineage that is ongoing. It's present in many places. Uh, we have to see what this means because uh, what mutations is it acquiring? Uh, B.6 lineage, uh, basically we don't see it anymore. This lineage became extinct. I mean, we, don't, we pretty much don't sequence it anymore. It was present largely in um, India and Southeast Asia, like Philippines, um, and it, it, was, uh, a, it caused a large outbreak in Malaysia. All right, so um, so we had done the study very early in the pandemic where we looked at the first 1,500 cases in the Indian state of Karnataka. And we sequenced uh, quite a large number of samples representative of many of the contact clusters. So Karnataka did very good contact tracing. So we had 47 people traced for every person who was infected during that time. So we got these 17 major clusters in the state. So what you're looking at uh, are people connected by spokes to the people they were contacts of. And we did sequencing to look at what lineages uh, they belong to. And we found these to be the sort of seven lineages in the state. So we knew there were multiple introductions and we thought this B.6 came from, mostly these people had a travel history to Delhi at that time. Um, but we also saw that a lot of cases that couldn't be assigned uh, a contact actually belonged to this. It already told us that this, uh, that it had spread, uh, uh, there was local spread. And, uh, but some of the clusters were quite tight and they were contained. So this was a quarantine center and we never saw B.4 again in the state. Uh, we also found at that time that it was mainly the symptomatic people. So here symptomatic people are in black. Uh, they were the people more likely to have uh, be the centers or the sort of spreaders compared to the asymptomatic people. And this was during the lockdown in India. So most of the cases were clustered uh, by uh, districts within the state. So there were some uh, clusters that had multiple districts, but most of them were like a single district. So this is Bangalore urban. So this is what we found from that study. There were multiple introductions of the virus into Karnataka, which is a state in South India. There's continued importation even during lockdown by domestic travel. So the domestic borders in India, they are quite porous and symptomatic individuals are spread across multiple lineages and uh, with asymptomatic individuals. There was no lineage that seemed to be associated with severe disease at that time. And that was the strength of our study that we linked the epidemiological data with the genomic data. Um, what is the situation now? So we have looked at cases from November um, to uh, Jan, and we have found that there are quite a few uh, imported UK variants. And the major lineage seems to be this B.1.36, as I mentioned earlier, and that forms quite a large part of the phylogenetic tree. And, um, and, it, and, and the sort of point that I wanted to make about this was, um, sorry, I'll just stick through this bit. Is that we find multiple uh, immune escape mutations and they seem to be appearing at different parts of the phylogenetic tree. So there is not one lineage that is acquiring uh, the immune escape mutations. They're coming up all over the place. So any lineage that continues for a long time is likely to acquire an immune escape mutation. So these are immune escape known, uh, like at least in in vitro studies, uh, these mutations are associated with immune escape. We find them in both circulated and in imported viruses. Um, and so we think that you need continuous genomic surveillance uh, to detect variants of concern. Uh, and they can occur, they're already circulating and they occur across multiple lineages. And we need to look at these two lineages in India and see whether uh, they are neutralized by antibodies from vaccines. And containing transmission chains is important. With that, I would just like to acknowledge uh, this work was possible because we had a lot of support, both from the government and from many people working in NIMHANS. 
I'm supported by an India Alliance Fellowship, and these are all the uh, institutes doing sequencing in India. Uh, with that, I just thank uh, the audience and the organizers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chitra, for that wonderful talk. Um, and thank you for highlighting the importance of variants and, and, uh, and immune escape. I, I'm sure there are many questions. I also have questions. So, but we will take the questions at, at the end, uh, at the discussion time uh, after all the talks. So, um, so uh, we would look forward to some of uh, uh, the questions that, that will come um, um, on, on, on this topic. Um, our next speaker for the day is Dr. Vasant Venugopal. Uh, Dr. Vasant Venugopal is a very good friend. He works at um, uh, Mahajan Imaging uh, at the Center for Advanced Research in Imaging, Neuroscience, and Genomics. So Vasant is a very unique um, um, person. He is a radiologist by training, uh, did a senior residency in radiology, uh, was an assistant professor, uh, in, in one of the top medical colleges in, in the country. Um, and then he took to research uh, um, and especially research that, that involves AI in, in radiology. So um, he has been working at uh, Kering uh, with the aim for uh, bringing AI um, to the bedside. And Kering has been very active in the last one year during the pandemic. And they have come up with a lot of innovative solutions um, um, during this pandemic time about, um, uh, about diagnostics for COVID-19 uh, using both um, imaging as well as uh, genomics. So without further ado, I, I, I would also mention that uh, Vasant is one of those very highly published AI and clinical researchers. He's, he's one of the authors of the first AI paper that came out in The Lancet. Um, and, and a very prolific author uh, in this um, area. So I look forward to your talk, especially in, uh, um, in COVID-19 and how you have been dealing with the pandemic and your response at caring about that. Over to you, Dr. Vasant Venugopal. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tao, for that uh, introduction. Uh, you can see my screen, I'm assuming, right? Yes, yes, Vasant, we can see you. Sure, uh, sure. Uh, I'm going to talk about the importance of context when we when are dealing with AI solutions, which is just become more important during this pandemic times. So I will briefly talk about the importance of context in AI and what we do in this area. So without you know much ado, jump into the uh, lecture. Uh, this paper, which was recently published, uh, actually uh, looked into almost every AI solution that has been proposed for COVID-19 and in imaging studies, in chest X-rays and CT scans, there are over 2,000 studies. And unfortunately, uh, the study concluded that none of the models identified are of potential clinical use due to methodological flaws or underlying biases. And some of the uh, you know uh, observations in the study included that uh, more than half of the papers fail in the mandatory criteria of the claim checklist and uh, nearly you know 55 of the 62 shortlisted studies had a very high risk of bias and uh, most of the studies didn't even bother to consider about doing an external validation for their uh, solutions which is a critical uh, step in before bringing out any ai solution to practice why has this happened right despite so much time research time and money being spent into uh, building these algorithms, none of them uh, is of any use, literally, you know, none of them is of any use in the clinical domain. Why has this happened? So uh, to understand that, you have to understand how uh, the uh, COVID presence on chest X-rays, right? Uh, so this is a, a, a chest X-ray. Uh, what you see here is, you know, the bilateral near symmetrical peripheral ground glass densities and consolidation, we are, which are very classical findings of uh, COVID-19 pneumonia on chest X-rays. So this is a very classical finding of COVID-19 pneumonia on chest X-rays. And this, this is another X-ray. Again, this has those similar peripheral uh, ground glass densities. So is this another case of COVID-19 pneumonia? So, but wait, uh, this case is actually from 2018. So what is it? So now consider a hypothetical situation of you know a radiologist reading chest X-ray and an algorithm AI solution which can predict uh, presence of COVID-19 
on chest x-rays. You are presenting a chest x-ray with uh, the classical findings from 2020 to the radiologist, and he's going to diagnose it as COVID-19 pneumonia. Now you present this uh, radiologist with an x-ray from 2018, letting him know that this is from 2018. What would he diagnose that as? So we will come back here again and present this same scenario to the AI solution that predicts COVID-19 pneumonia from chest x-ray. X-ray from 2020, it's going to call it as COVID-19 pneumonia, well, good. And the X-ray from 2018, it's going to call that as COVID-19 pneumonia, whereas the radiologist is not going to call that as COVID-19 pneumonia because he's aware of the context of the X-ray, right? The context here is the time of presentation. He knows that this X-ray uh, is from the pandemic times and the uh, any, any patient with a finding similar to those which is present on the X-ray is 99% likely to be having a COVID-19 pneumonia than otherwise. So several such contexts exist in, uh, in, in, in the clinical domain while evaluating clinical studies. They may include clinical symptoms, age, demography, comorbid conditions, habits, and addictions. All of these contexts can be factored in what we call as pre-test probability. Uh, you know, to your surprise and to my surprise, none of the AI solutions available in the market now uh, consider this context, right? Either the pretest probability or the context. They are all, you know, pure play image, uh, uh, you know, analysis software, uh, software in isolation. So that doesn't work in clinical domain very well. So to touch upon what exactly uh, is a contextual AI, there are four pillars to the uh, contextual AI, right? It's, it's based on four broad principles. Intelligibility, number one, adaptivity, customizability, and context awareness, right? What is intelligibility? It's the ability of an algorithm to explain itself to its users. It's very important. We have uh, done uh, quite a few uh, work in this area, which I'll touch upon in the later part of this. And adaptivity is the ability to run uh, the same solution to run in different clinical situations and meet the user's expectations accordingly. And custom customizability is the ability of the solution of the user to gain access to the solution and uh, modify the functions to his needs. And finally, is the context awareness, which is the core requirement of contextual AI, where the system has the capacity to uh, see the problem at the same level as the human does, right? It has a sufficient perception of uh, the environment of the application, right? The clinical picture, the clinical presentation, the time of application, all those things. So these are four broad principles of the contextual uh, AI. Uh, what is, what is the biggest news that has happened for radiology AI in this week? That is the recommendation by WHO of, you know, uh, recommendation to use computed aided detection software programs in place of human readers for interpreting digital cyst x-rays for screening and triage of TB disease, right? So the recommendation exactly reads these words, right? Among individuals, age 15 years and older in populations in which TB screening is recommended, uh, CAD programs can be used in place of human readers for interpreting chest x-rays for screening as well as triage of TB disease. So there is a small problem in this uh, recommendation, you know, according to me, uh, which is that it's recommending it for both screening and triage. So we'll briefly see uh, the definitions for triage and screening. A triage, as we all know, is a process of, uh, you know, deciding uh, a care pathway for people who present with a symptom, right? A symptom of the disease. You know the symptoms, signs, and the risk markers and other things. Whereas screening is a test which you do uh, on apparently healthy populations to identify the disease at a very early stage. Uh, is it fair to apply uh, the uh, same kind of validation test results to both screening and triage? So that's the problem in this recommendation because if you see Again, uh, come back to the same uh, radiologist and AI problem here. You're presenting uh, to a radiologist and a chest X-ray with uh, findings similar, looking like TB, and you know, and you tell him that this patient has clinical features of TB, so he's more likely to diagnose that X-ray as having TB. Whereas if you are giving uh, an X-ray with uh, findings uh, similar to TB, but you don't provide any clinical information, you don't say that there is what's the pretest probability for that particular patient is less likely to call that as a TB than a triad solutions. Bring in this AI solution. It's going to call uh, in both scenarios uh, as TB with the same probability, right? There's no, there's, uh, there's no 
uh, not going to be any change in the likelihood of its TV prediction in both these scenarios. That's where this recommendation doesn't hold good. You can't place both triage and screening in the same bucket uh, without adding uh, or ignoring the clinical information. Because if you go back, uh, the clinical study on which this recommendation is based, this is based on this particular study published in Nature Research last year, where the validation study of uh, multiple AI algorithms has been performed on uh, patients with symptoms, right? They were adults who had uh, symptoms suggestive of TB, uh, very classical TB. They were enrolled in uh, you know, uh, Cameroon and Nepal, and the AI solutions were compared with the readers here. And the comparison which had led to the recommendation that the AI solutions perform better that, than humans is based on a flawed assumption here that if you keep the sensitivity of both the human readers and the uh, AI algorithm similar, you end up observing that the AI solutions have a very high uh, specificity as compared to the human reader. But uh, the consideration that has been missed here is the human reader here is aware that all these uh, uh, patients who have been enrolled in the study were suspected, highly suspected of, of having TB, but the algorithms didn't have uh, uh, you know, that kind of clinical context there. So they ended up, uh, uh, you know, uh, showing that they have high specificity uh, as compared to the human reader. So here, uh, you know, that's what has happened here. You have put the uh, triage and screening in the same bucket and have validated this algorithms and have come out with the recommendation in the same kind of sweep. So here, the, in, in triage setting, uh, I, I might even uh, end up agreeing that the AI has scored better than the humans. But in the screening setting, do we know? Do you have results? Uh, how would have the algorithm has performed if you have applied the same test on healthy individuals saying that you know uh, where the human readers are uh, are told that the specialists are told that there is no clinical suspicion of tb if you have compared the specificity at those clinical settings how would have the algorithms performed we don't know yet no study has been published in fact uh, you know to my to the best of my knowledge not much studies have been published uh, comparing the performance of ai algorithms on screening population so that's where the entire you know uh, problem of uh, context our awareness of algorithms comes into play yeah? context our algorithms uh, context and our algorithms cannot have equivalent performance in different clinical settings right whether it's you know you can't compare them uh, compare the performances which has been validated in a trials testing and forecasted into screen screening in clinical settings that's the problem there and, and, and in, in, in all AI versus human baseline comparative retrospective studies that has been published during COVID times, non-COVID times, uh, you know, the context awareness, in fact, ends up reducing the specificity of human readers. But in real world, this context awareness helps the humans perform much, much better than the retrospective controlled kind of study settings because they will have more contextual information at their disposal. Right, and, the, and and one more clear distinction which we have to make in, in all in analyzing all these AI solutions is between findings and disease. Right, consolidation, uh, nodule, and effusion. These are all findings. They they don't uh, need to be uh, need to have a context there. Right, and this is a perceptual task. You uh, see a particular kind of imaging feature, you call that finding. But if you want to translate these findings into disease, you need to be aware of the context. Right, you can't call uh, COVID nineteen directly on chest X rays because it as a consolidation, but you don't know the uh, context there, right? This uh, kind of uh, uh, direct prediction of disease from uh, imaging studies without the context is, is actually uh, not uh, possible. Uh, it's, it's actually a cognitive task which a human performs much better, uh, whereas the AI might be good at perceptual tasks, but, uh, you know, uh, building in all the information of uh, the clinical and the imaging features and to uh, you know, get into the disease is a cognitive task which humans are better at doing. And the other key important, uh, you know, characteristic of a context of AI is what we call as intelligibility or understandability, which is actually a characteristic of a model to uh, make a human understand uh, its function. And there are two elements to that. There is one model understandability and human understandability. Uh, what I mean by model understandability, I would uh, take this uh, example here. Uh, here you see two X-rays looking very similar to uh, a normal person. But uh, if you see, uh, uh, you know, uh, closely, uh, this uh, on, the, on the right side is a normal chest X-ray of a healthy female. And on the left side is a, a chest X-ray of, again, a healthy female 
but uh, the patient had, had a mastectomy, right? And if you kind of zoom in here, uh, I'll just zoom in and show you. So if you see here, there is a, a faint amount of increased density, like increased opacity, like appearance here as compared to this area. What happens is many of these AI algorithms end up calling this, uh, uh, you know, particular uh, area, uh, the difference in the density between this and this area as having uh, consolidation on the right side, right? This is a this is a, one of the biases which has been introduced by the algorithm because of very low sample of post mastectomy patients in the training data. What happens, you know, when you propagate this bias, right? If you don't, uh, you know, understand the existence of such biases and assume that an algorithm A, which has a problem like this towards a particular uh, group, uh, gets recommended universally by, uh, you know, WHO for uh, you know, uh, large scale adoption, it puts that small percent of uh, population at a uh, unfair disadvantage. We haven't tested such biases at scale. And, uh, you know, uh, what will happen eventually is if, even if uh, WHO ends up recommending multiple algorithms uh, for, uh, for screening, uh, for universal screening, and if both the algorithms had shared training data because that's how it happens right the nih just x-ray 14 data set is 100000 uh, x-rays which is being shared by almost every single chest x-ray algorithm and if that data set had the uh, uh, under sampling of a particular group that bias is going to be systematized across uh, all algorithms you know across all solutions which has been recommended and it, and it, it becomes a systematic issue there so that's what uh, you know a problem which comes uh, without uh, doing a proper validation for biases. And we also don't know uh, what will happen uh, for multi-axis biases, right? In this particular uh, testings, which we do, uh, we may can include representative test sets for expected bias groups, lay for children, patients with implants, but how do you evaluate a hither to unknown multi-intersection multi biases, right? What will happen if there is a patient child with implant, how do you, test for those biases, right? Uh, can uh, concatenation of algorithms would be a proper solution for that? Or do we need to keep humans in loop for certain impossible combination of outputs? Those are open questions which need uh, more work. And, and coming to the problem of understandability and differentiating it from explainability, explainability is kind of looks at the entire problem from a top-down approach, right? Explainable AI is, is actually a domain of AI scientists and engineers. Whereas understandable AI is the domain of users. I will kindly uh, touch upon some of our uh, studies to bring this uh, clear distinction. This is a work which we published last year in academic radiology, where we try to unbox an AI uh, solution which can characterize a lung nodule into benign or malig malignant uh, nodule. Uh, what we had uh, the, uh, from the developers had an explainability output. They used a technique called occlusion where different parts of the nodule have been blocked and an explainability map has been produced. Uh, very good, right? This is an explainability output, but does it make any sense to the domain user? Does radiologist uh, can infer anything from this explainability map? No, not at all. So that's why we, we are trying to convert such explain, explainability maps into understandable AI maps, right? What we try to do is we uh, you know, classified all these different explainability maps into features, right? Which a radiologist can understand. We defined uh, different features for each of these maps, uh, taking into consideration the domain understanding of these nodules. We called features like peripheral heat, heat on classification, so on. Right? Uh, interested audience can go into uh, the paper and read more detailed uh, analysis of how we converted an explainable AI into understandable AI outputs. And also, we also do a lot of explainability comparison between uh, different algorithms. Uh, this is our recent paper where we introduced a concept called clinical explainability failure, where we compared two different algorithms, you know, uh, uh, had uh, the two algorithms, uh, the algorithm one had a high low sensitivity, whereas the other algorithm had a high sensitivity of 76%. At the surface of it, it looks like like you know, the algorithm two has a better performance. But we, what really did was we looked into the explainability maps produced by these two algorithms, you know, and we tried to see if there is any overlap between the uh, explainability bounding box produced by the radiologist and the explainability maps by produced by the algorithm to see if whether the algorithm is looking at the 
uh, area where uh, the reader uh, or the user will agree that there is a sense to which the algorithm is uh, uh, you know seeing and we can infer that the uh, the understanding of algorithm uh, the working of the algorithm is understandable to the domain users we we introduced this concept here and we measured the failures between these algorithms and we found out that the algorithm even to one which have, even to had a low sensitivity had a very uh, you know good explainability component with a very low explainability failure ratio whereas the other algorithm had a very high explainability ratio so that's kind of uh, you know brief takeaway from me uh, i don't have much time to go into these details uh, i will uh, excuse me for that but the uh, take home message here is the ai applications for medical uh, context should be uh, should have uh, context awareness built into them and the biases uh mitigation of the biases of these algorithms can only be possible by focusing on the understandability feature of these algorithms and we have to build appropriate audit tools and evaluation tools uh, for doing these uh, you know evaluations thank you so much for giving thank me you so much thank you so much for uh, for for the very interesting topic of contextual ai and illuminating the biases and also touching upon how this becomes very important in uh, uh, when you have a large number of studies that are getting published in covid-19 um, we will again look forward to questions i can already see there's questions in the chat window but we'll come back to these after um, listening to our third speaker um, who is uh, dr who is nina uh, restich so uh, nina graduated in applied mathematics from the university of ljubljana Uh, faculty of mathematics and physics in 2012 she has a diverse uh, a very diverse set of experience um, um she she's she's worked in the industry of aviation and aerospace engineering um, and then she started working um, as a researcher and a phd student at the joseph stefan uh, international post -gradu graduate uh, school her research interests involve human activity recognition ambient intelligence mathematical modeling nutrition modeling and optimization and nutrition monitoring tools and she has numerous uh, contributions to uh, to the competitions and prizes including the shl activity recognition competition uh, she was a part of the winning team in 2018 19 and 20 um, and she is a she was a member of the cooking recognition uh, challenge competition winning team uh, mainly contributing by integrating her experience from the aviation industry she was also a member of the x prize response challenge second place winning team j j sai versus covid where she was responsible for epidemiological modeling and she also um, has received a ba in jazz flute um, so she's a musician as well uh, so with all that um, uh, diverse set of expertise and um, 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 uh, skills she has been integrating uh, um, solutions and i'm very excited to uh, to hear what she has to uh, to talk about uh, in the covid-19 models so all over to you uh, nina thank you so much okay um thank you so much for the presentation um thank you also for inviting us to have a talk about our work here um just let me ask the most commonly asked question can you see my screen Yes, it is visible. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Uh -huh, now we are not seeing the. Okay, now you see the right one, I guess. Okay, so like I said, thank you very much for inviting us. I'm here to speak on the behalf of the whole team, because a team of twelve people involved in this, uh, and to describe the approach we take for the X Prize Pandemic Response Challenge, which we then won one of the first. um rewards so maybe just a little short about our uh, background so we we are from the Joseph Stefan Institute in Ljubljana Slovenia this is the largest slovenian research organization it has around 1000 staff and it was established almost 70 years ago um the, today the main research is on physics um, uh, the other area is chemistry materials and environment and then of course the computer and information technology and the institute is also a founder of the international pods radio school where many of the team members have achieved 
achieve their PhD or are still or are we still um, pursuing it? So maybe something about the Department of Intelligence Systems. This is where specifically our team came from. So we're all from the same department. We are um, um, specialized in applied research on artificial intelligence. There are four main research groups um, from ambient intelligence to agents, computational intelligence, uh, and then language technologies. And we do a lot of our research in the health domain actually. So we either interpret the sensor data for activity recognition, uh, human ex energy expenditure estimation, um, either for the fall detection, heart rate detection, blood pressure, um, using the PPG sensors. And we also do a lot of mining on health data um, and some diagnostic. So when this um, COVID situation came around about a year ago, we were forced um, also start looking into this different uh, importance of features to, to, to predict the, the, the outcome of COVID. And when uh, we heard about the pandemic response challenge, we said we decided to give it a try, although the epidem epidemics were not something we had uh, a lot of uh, or had at all the experience with, with before. So um, I don't know how familiar are you with this uh, competition? I guess I'm pretty sure some of you are, some of you maybe aren't. So let me just give a brief um, overview. So the whole idea was to um, design for in the first phase, which, was called, which went on um, until from October to the end of December uh, in 2020, in which, one, in which we had to um, design a predictor, which will predict the number of infect, infections for all countries. And then in the second phase was this prescriptor. So where we actually tried to um, provide intervention plans as a response to the pandemics. So um, this was the main idea. So we decided, um, although we have a more <clears throat> experience in machine learning, but still when learning around it, we saw that the, this epidemiological model, which I guess some of you are familiar with, is the same model where you model four different states, from, so from the susceptible to the exposed and then infected, and then in the last point recovered. Um, as this was something that was commonly used and also for us, um, was giving the best results compared to maybe some traditional machine learning stuff. Um, so these SEER models are, as I described, model like this. What we decided to maybe do a bit differently or um, is to actually model this parameter beta, which is the infection rate, as a time variant, um, time dependent uh, variable. So it we allowed it to change from time to time. And we fitted it on different parts of the uh, timeline through the day. So this, you can see here on this picture, the final, let me say the final fit uh, for one of the countries. I believe it was France in this case. Um, so yes, what we then did further is we decided um, to use machine learning um, um, on the past data that we had on the past features from the previous data to actually predict the betas from for the uh, future models. So we learned the betas from all the countries, from all the um, data that we achieved from, from the past, and then um, used it when modeling the, data, the, the infections further. Um, so the, <clears throat> the features that we found had the most impact on this beta were, um, as you may be expected, the countermeasures, then the number of effect, infections, and then much lower were some other features, the weather development, culture. We um, gathered a lot of data actually as a part of this um, from different, um, different sources. 
and we tried to combine all the possibilities, but in the end, what we show, what we saw is that countermeasures were really the most impactful from the features. Um, further on, the actual countermeasures that we found uh, had the most importance or the most strength uh, were the work, workplace closing, the school closing, going from left to right, and then testing policy. And then later on, um, some restrictions on gatherings and internal movement and so on. Uh, but yes, the second phase where we actually had to um, work with the prescriptions was to find the, 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 the intervention plans for the length of 30, from 30 to the 90 days, where we had to change um, this prescriptions on uh, this uh, intervention plans weekly and try to find the best outcome. So um, as we would say, the, the healthy relation between the uh, number of infections and of course the stringency of the intervention plans because you don't want to um, maybe stop everything for a long period of time because it starts to impact other um, aspects of life as well. So how did the phase two went on? Um, so these um, phase one predictors from the teams that gave the mean were combined in one standard predictor. And then um, the weights were set to these uh, intervention plans. So um, these uh, countermeasures, actually, the, the countermeasures. So the higher the weight, the most important you find it and you maybe um, want to... Um, to give it more, more importance to some, some, some of these uh, countermeasures. So yes, then the 10 prescription plans were um, conducted with the standard predictor and we got the, this um, 10 plans that kind of had the best trade-off between the average stringency and the average infection. Uh, of course, the first idea that we had is that the multi-objective optimization would be the optimal way to tackle this problem because this is what it does. However, we learned that the standard predictor was too slow. So it um, took around 90 seconds for 45 evaluations. And we were, I think, um, um, that the idea was to, to calculate all these um, prescriptions in uh, six hours for all countries and it just kind of wasn't possible actually. <clears throat> so we decided to actually use the surrogate model and to also pre-calculate plans, plans in advance because of course when the, when the organizers ran our code we only had six hours but from the time that we started working on this problem to the time where we actually uh, gave in the, 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 our uh, solution, we had much, much longer, uh, much more time. So we were able to pre-calculate the plans. Um, we then um, combined the 10 solutions that we got from the surrogate models and the 10 from the pre-calculated plans and combined them. Um, and here is the time management. As you can see, then the multi-objective optimization took about two thirds of this 19 seconds that we had for each country available. Um, and all the other took much less time. Um, so yes, then the, um, here then the evolutionary algorithms came in as a part of tackling this problem. So we chose the set of random plans. Uh, this was evaluated. The best plans were selected, then the crossover was done on this and some mutations, and then the new plans uh, returned to the, the first state, and then this was running on until we got the, the best surviving plans, so the plans that performed the best. Um, so, however, these evolutionary algorithms only were in the end returning to us the stringency. And we wanted to, to um, 
convert the stringency to, um, to these uh, plans, to the intervention plans. And here we used, uh, we came up with uh, the algorithm, which actually we learned that the IPs, <clears throat> so the intervention plans, add up almost linearly. So from there on, we deducted that uh, each plan has its cost and contribution. And to actually put the plans together, it was similar to the knep knepsack problem. So where you try to fill up to the stringency with the different combinations of the contributions and so on, and still uh, remain within the, the limit of the cost. Um, so yes, here um, was the to, to um, um, pre-calculated plans. With the pre-calculated -pre plans, we saw that if the infections are raising fast, then we choose the, um, we, we, we separated these plants in 12 different groups based on the, um, how fast the infections are either raising or falling. And then if the infections were raising fast, we, we prescribed them something with high stringency. And if the infections were falling fast, the stringency of the intervention plans could be lower. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, due to the time limit, we also had to um, use the surrogate models. So what we did is instead, instead of using the standard predictor, we used our developed SER model and use it, used it not to predict the, not to um, predict the numbers of the, of the actual infections, but rather to, to, um, to predict the, the standard predictor. So this was much faster. And then this code was also rewritten from Python to C. So we used some um, C code also in it. So this also helped us speed up. And we decided that uh, to predict instead of um, on a daily basis, to predict in seven day intervals and then just take some average number was still um, close enough um, error regarding the possible error and sped up the whole calculation even more. So we had more time for the uh, actual most time limiting uh, algorithms time demanding algorithm, sorry. Um, so our solution um, we has put us here on the Pareto front here, here um, in this blue. So it seems that the solution that we took um, combined with the standard, standard predictor that we get, what we all got from the organizers put us on this Pareto front and <clears throat> it proved as um, seemingly very good. Um, however, as a part, here is also, um, as a part of uh, our submission, we also created a web page. So it, this was for um, maybe for other teams at the point of the competition to use and also for these decision makers where they can upload their plans and then they can check where it falls regarding the most optimal plans. So, um, I can later show you the web page if there will be some interest and I can show you how uh, is it possible to play around. But yes, as you can see, for instance, this seven um, plan seven that we show is very strict. So it has a very large um, stringency, very high stringency, but it also um, keeps the number of infections very low on the on this Pareto front. Um, so yes, <clears throat> um, here is also the team. Um, I believe uh, a colleague of mine, Vito, is also present today at the call. Um, he was in charge of the integration, so he is also available for, I guess, some more technical um, questions. Um, however, yes, this is the whole team. Um, it was a hard work, but it was uh, hopefully something that will be useful for the COVID and Hopefully also if it happens um, for some other pandemics, if it comes to that ever, Hope, hopefully not, but yeah. So thank you for your intentions and 
for the questions. I believe we can discuss them. Thank you, Nina, for that wonderful talk. Indeed, um, in depth and uh, very much detailed. Uh, we look forward to the questions uh, from the audience on this. And uh, let's open the house with questions. And uh, I can see there's a bunch of questions that uh, that that are currently being discussed on the chat. I I would just like to start with one um, to both Chitra and to uh, Vasant. So to Chitra, my question is, um, so we are sequencing these uh, new strains and, um, and we are finding retrospectively what may have happened. So um, what, I mean, where do you see us in terms of being able to use AI to predict uh, what strains may emerge and what could be the functional consequences um, by looking at some of the mutations in the strains? And do you think uh, it's likely in the coming years uh, that virology will change in that direction uh, where such continuous surveillance will become uh, embedded into our systems? So Chitra, that's my first question to you. Well, uh, so about so I'll, I'll answer the second part. Like, will is this likely to change genomic surveillance? Unfortunately, what has happened even now is that there's surveillance for SARS-CoV-2, but we are not doing uh, surveillance for other pathogens. So it's coming at the cost of something else, and uh, there is not that much incentive to prevent. Uh, things, right? So, uh, no, I don't think that genomic surveillance will become a norm, but I think that we will have better and more standardized tools for genomic surveillance throughout the world. And as far as uh, the use of AI for predicting mutations, um, we didn't, we did not expect SARS-CoV-2 to, to accumulate so many mutations. This was since November, we have been surprised uh, by the virus. And uh, so I think that uh, it is it is hard to understand where that came from. So a lot of it has to do both with behavior uh, of people as well as the virus, uh, given that the possibilities are large. So I don't know about AI enough, but I would think that we don't understand the context right now for it to be useful. That's what I got from uh, <laughs> uh, the second Thank you, talk. Chitra. No, absolutely, I agree. Um, I think... Um, um, understanding the context in which the mutations arise is perhaps going to be uh, very important. Um, I'll quickly ask my next question to Dr. Vasant uh, Venugopal. So Vasant, uh, there's all this talk about contextual AI, and at the same time, there's also a lot of talk about generalizability of models. So on one hand, we want our models to generalize to many different settings, take, take my model and make it work anywhere. On the other hand, uh, as clinicians, we understand that that all clinical decision making is contextual. So this question is also related to one of the questions from the attendees who is asking uh, that AI is a good example of inductive reasoning um, and biases that we may accumulate um, during the during the inductive process will show up um, eventually in in the AI models. And are we there yet? So would you, would you um, uh, shed some light on what do you think about this dilemma of generalizability versus contextual AI from being both a, a AI researcher as well as a clinician? Uh, actually, uh, there is always this pushback, uh, you know, whenever we talk about bias in AI. So uh, even there was a question in the chat also, what about human bias, right? Uh, the problem uh, here is number one, uh, you know, I completely agree that there is a lot of human bias and I personally feel that if there is a feasible improvement in either the human or the algorithmic decision making, we should do it, right? We should work towards removing the biases in the AI systems. And uh, coming to the generalizability uh, as well as the context problem, uh, we have to understand that uh, whatever be the solution, uh, you can uh, build it generalizable to across uh, domains and uh, you know deployment sites but there needs to be some kind of fine tuning that has to be happen happening at the site and given the way the uh, solutions the maturity of solutions now it's always uh, going to be uh, uh, have a human in the loop right when you have a human in the loop a generalizable solution which is fine tuned uh, to the uh, existing clinical deployment site, I think most of these 
the problems are addressed for now the the holy grail of having a complete end to end unsupervised solution is at least decades away in my personal opinion right and i on, on a similar line i think uh, uh, professor ramesh raskar has asked a question uh, that what about the biases that human radiologists might have uh, so so do you think um, are we in a chicken and egg situation uh, no, no, in all this human yeah mm -hmm. no that's that's what i was saying uh, tav right i uh, completely agree that human biases also there but if there is a feasible improvement in either the human or algorithmic decision we should be doing that right and we shouldn't uh, it, it shouldn't be argument that since uh, humans are bad at it the algorithms it's okay to be uh, having algorithms be as bad as humans at it right right so, and i do believe for example some ai methods can also illuminate some of these biases that human reasoning might have and also advance our own understanding of the field um, or of um, or advance of knowledge of um, uh, of of clinical and, as well as yeah and 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 tab also coming to the argument that uh, the ai can uh, it's uh, you know help to unearth patterns which are either to unknown to humans Uh, it's still in theory right uh, i haven't seen any published study bringing out uh, you know uh, that kind of patterns which has not been known to humans being unearthed by ai and being still useful in clinical domain believe me we work a lot on that we work on image translation we try to uh, predict diffusion weighted images from t2 weighted images predict pet images from c2 weighted images all of that is still theory you know if there is a study which proves this concept no i would kind of agree that's a great point argument yeah and christine asked a question on um so what about just adding the pre test odds as a variable for uh, ai to train on so would you think that that's, everything would be captured in the prevalences and yeah that's that's possible and still uh, groups are working on that adding clinical features to it adding a clinical layer uh, as one of the you know output in fact one of our work on uh, covid uh, you know uh, AI algorithm. Believe we also built an AI algorithm for COVID in partnership with IGIB. Uh, there, what we did was we used uh, the AI algorithm to identify the imaging patterns. That's that uh, perceptual layer. And for the cognitive layer, we used uh, human intelligence to uh, to have a decision tree. Right. We we uh, fitted in all those perceptual features into the decision tree and arrived at the conclusion. So that kind of solutions. Uh, uh, may kind of uh, or are still being built, and they may address this contextuality problem. Thank you, Vasan. Uh, we have another question for Chitra. So, Chitra, uh, one of the questions is that: uh, Do we have clinical outcomes data from your variance study? So, you said many of them are from symptomatic patients. Uh, so, what about how many hospitalized treatments and recovery outcomes on on some of these variants? Um, so the question is about um, looking at the specific outcomes that uh, the the patients are presenting uh, with uh, with these variants right so i we don't have that uh, for our analysis right now but uh, it's because you need to correlate it with the data from the state and so on so we haven't done that yet but uh, we looked at on we sequenced only those viruses Uh, which had a high viral load that is low ct values so they're sort of correlated so these are from um, low ct we saw a trend towards low ct values in bangalore and so we sequenced intensely from that time with the idea that we might find variants uh no but i don't have uh, we don't have the disease severity bit yet right and going forward do you think that these data may be available at some point of time to integrate into models uh we have to do that i mean there's i think that if we want the sequencing to make sense we need to have all of that information uh okay. for sure yeah correct and i think this is a general question for for all the three uh, and i'll start perhaps with neena so uh, what are the three mandatory criteria for ai applications in covid i mean this is a pretty broad question uh but uh, but but i think uh, it's important from the standpoint of uh, setting our expectations right from ai algorithms in in covid so nina would you like to take a first shot at it yeah thank you <laughs> for the question um i don't know if maybe i have the right answer i guess somebody will then 
um, <clears throat> fill in. But what I think is important is that you try to, that we try to kind of standardize the data because the, for instance, the number of infections were changing from country to country based on the way of the, their testing base of um, <clears throat> their um, reporting also, not just the testing based on the everything. So here is one um, very important thing that has to be taken into account when um, providing. Um, then of course, um, when, le when learning on the some countries, <clears throat> um, you of course, uh, <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, if you learn just for some countries and then try to overfit on them, then it doesn't work in some other other cases or um, I don't know some models that work for some countries because they don't. Uh, in our case, they didn't very much follow the countermeasures and then find the uh, good trade-off between the um fitting on some of them and still not use losing the the, the errors so um yeah this is what comes to mind um, thank, you. Side, thank, but, yeah. thank you no i think standardization of data and i also see some responses on checklists being created um so absolutely i think ai researchers could come together towards that so same question to you Vasant. Uh, um, what are your thoughts about uh, criteria that should be implemented for successful AI solutions in COVID-19? Uh, uh, number one, uh, data, right? Uh, you need lots and lots of data, sanctions data. Uh, most of the solutions, uh, believe me, for built on data which has been downloaded from sites like Radiopedia and Google, right? You don't even know whether they are real data from COVID positive patients. Are they matched RT-PCR tests for those patients or just that, you know, uh, some radiologists feel that that's a COVID, so it's a COVID data. So the data needs to be very uh, kind of authentic. That's the starting point. And the validation should be proper and uh, have an external validation set. So those are two major criteria. From application perspective, I don't expect any AI solution to diagnose COVID on chest X-rays. Uh, the one application which I would love uh, AI solutions can help is risk stratification, right? Uh, predicting that this particular patient with so many findings in x-ray is going to go downhill please admit him or uh, send him home so that kind of risk stratification is what ai needs to do not diagnose covid on just x-ray that's not thanks uh, we have a question from christine uh, and the question is to nina uh, so uh, what sort of algorithms did you use to predict beta so did it take in npis each day or um, would you would you uh, please provide some details on on the methods? Yeah, um, so I think this question was also already answered also in the chat by my colleague Vito. But um, yeah, the thing is, we we took some of the standard machine learning algorithms. We stayed on the classical side just due to the um, <clears throat> complexity and the time limit we had. Uh, and yes, we took the daily MPIs um, in account also. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Nina. And, and, and in response to Chitra's uh, uh, comment on the, uh, on, the, on the rate at which the virus is mutating, so there's a question uh, which, is, which is again asked by Christine to Chitra, do you think the virus is mutating more rapidly now? Or is it just that we weren't sequencing enough earlier? So that's a great question, uh, Chitra. Um, so there is some evidence from the evolution of the B.1.17, which is a UK variant that the lineage that was just the parent of that lineage accumulated mutations faster. Uh, that is sort of the, however, uh, the phylogenetic relationships in SARS-CoV-2 are a bit difficult uh, because the same mutations come up in multiple lineages. Uh, so if you aren't sequencing enough, you may not find the right phylogenetic relationship. So you need to do both. Great, okay, right. And I can see there's more, more questions on the machine learning algorithms that, uh, that have been uh, used uh, um, by Nina's group. And um, in terms of predicting mutations, Chitra, what is the best that we can do? I mean, um, we, we, we need to work on this um, is, uh, um, 
is probably something that's suggested on in the chats as well. So yeah. Yeah. So uh, theoretically, the hotspot predictions, I think that has been well worked out in the past. But now, I guess the question is, how do we integrate the real world scenario, uh, given that we are seeing things in this virus that we wouldn't predict from theory? How do we integrate these things? So long transmission chains uh, leading to the same different lineages accumulating uh, the same mutation. So the immune escape mutations coming up again and again. So how many transmission chains does it need to go through? So these kind of things are not standard cell by like, you know, standard molecular biology. They're not standard epidemiology. You need to combine very different fields to develop insights. Uh, so that is Correct. the challenge. Correct. And Ramesh, uh, Professor Ramesh is asking that, um, uh, what about protein folding problems? Do you see also a connection between uh, protein folding problems and the way we could understand mutations and sequences? Yeah, for sure. And for the uh, receptor binding domain of the spike protein, this is what has been done. People have sort of predicted, uh, they've looked at sort of plasticity. What, what are the regions that will take mutations better than others without a change and so on. So we sort of know what mutation, which regions tolerate mutations well. And a lot of that has come from the soil structural studies and so on. So that has moved really fast, actually. So, great. great. If you can, if you can just add one aspect to that question, which is, you know, clearly uh, protein folding. I mean, you know, you know, the virus goes through, you know, the DNA of the virus goes through RNA, expresses as protein. So it's pretty far downstream. Uh, you can't really predict from the, you know, the the DNA structure of the virus what the protein would look like. So I didn't, I didn't mean like, you know, uh, alpha fold would directly benefit you know, how the virus mutations would would work. But I would just imagine that, you know, given the given the 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 impact of the virus only matters on the shape of the protein itself. Right? Because it's, the, it's not the mutation that matters. It's, what matters is the shape it expresses as the protein. That, that's the link I was trying to make. So not not uh. predict the, not predict the mutation of the virus, but predict the mutation of the protein. Uh, sure, yeah. So that's why uh, usually we think that the structural genes will tolerate mutations less well, right? So the spike protein and so on will tolerate mutations uh, because, so yeah, uh, yes, I, I see your point. And that's why you would look at the structural genes first and they can tell you, they, they can give you a sort of, uh, uh, how do you, the space around which the virus can move or the mutational landscape for that virus. And for SARS-CoV-2, unfortunately, it looks like that's a large space. And are so these, people have. I'm not a biologist. Are these structures visible in multiple places in the, in the genomic sequence? Is that the problem or? Uh, yeah, so the structural genes in the case of SARS-CoV-2 cluster towards the end. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, but people have done this sort of uh, studies to look at which are the mutations that the virus can tolerate. And for most viruses, we would say, for example, for viruses for which vaccines have been very effective, like measles and uh, polio and so on, uh, the, this, this thing called antigenic plasticity, it's sort of low. They've sort of sunk into a state uh, where we can now target them quite well. But for SARS-CoV-2, it seems like it's evolving. Uh, so we are looking at a moving target. Okay. Just wait one more, if I can add, Tav. Uh, like six months ago, almost everybody said, don't worry about mutations. It's a pretty stable virus. And now suddenly we have all the mutations and you know, all the vaccine makers says, yeah, it'll be fine. So why, why do we have this ping pong? I mean, we didn't expect it based on everything that we know, but there is no virus that we have uh, seen for going through the human population for so long and hitting so many people. So it's just been here long enough to explore all these different states. Okay. Uh, see, if you had asked me one year ago, I would have said this is an unlikely scenario that something would accumulate 17 mutations. And we know at least four or five lineages that have already done that. Mm -hmm. So, Absolutely. So, um, I mean, so that just, uh, that just goes to show, I think it's a very important area of research and perhaps uh, needs more understanding both biologically and computationally. So I think we have no more questions. Um, and we are also cognizant of the time. Um, so uh, perhaps we uh, we can end the session. Ramesh, would you like to close the session? Um, I just, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I see, I see, I see Vito has joined from 
uh, the Express team along with Nina. And I just wanted to see if he wants to say hello and just introduce himself. And I know he's been answering some of the questions, but pick the, some few of the questions and, and, and let us know. I mean, I can say hello and <laughs> thank you for inviting us. Um, it's been a pleasure being here today. So I'm not sure what else to say. <laughs> if you can just if you can just answer some of the questions uh, on the chat, which is, you know, which models you're using and what you think uh, some of the work you might be doing in Slovenia with these models and uh, and, and so on. Yeah, so we made our um, CR epidemiological models, but like what I think is in a way even more interesting is that the X Prize competition um, during this competition, a lot of competitors made a lot of models. And what the organizers did is they aggregated all these models into one, basically kind of a, predicts the average of all. And this, at least, uh, it needs a bit more testing, but it seems that it works better than any individual model. And so this competition really um, brought together this research community to collaborate and create something better than any individual could. So, I, and I think this model that we're doing in this aggregated fashion could really be useful, but uh, now we're writing this paper and we have to, have to do a lot of tests actually, but um, uh, that's kind of a, the idea behind it. Yeah, yeah. That's what, I mean, I mean, Tov, it's, it's fascinating, right? We have been seeing this for some time uh, and I know a lot of the work that's happening worldwide. Maybe Nina, you can answer this question on uh, in Slovenia and maybe in neighboring countries. Uh, what's, what's kind of the, the view of, you know, collecting more data and make it available to planners and researchers uh, because, you know, this work can be only as good as, as the data that, that's available. Yeah, so um, actually we're trying um, to communicate this work uh, we did with um, our decision makers. And there is also a lot of discussion, yes, on the transparency of the data on providing the valid data from the institutions that had the data because just with the very good data you can get i mean the models follow the data right so if you don't have the right data the models still work but not as they should but if you get the right data from the right people then hopefully um, we will be able to to even um adverse it forward yeah <clears throat> part of the work we're doing at mit and also uh, at pathcheck is on vaccination and it's disappointing that we don't even get data for zip code, you know, like per, per, per city in the US. It's very exhausting and very challenging that the government refuses to release that data. And a lot of times it's because they don't want to create a panic saying, hey, some zip codes are doing better than others, or, you know, there's vulnerable population or, or minority population in one area, they're not doing. So they're trying to kind of protect themselves, uh, but it's also problematic because, you know, even in one of the most, you know, all this democracy, you know, we don't have transparency to this data that really matters. Yeah, I guess we're kind of lucky maybe on this side. We have a very um, specific group of also some researchers here from Slovenia that are on their free time doing this um, data collection side. And they are also trying to follow now with the vaccination. So per region, but then again, the Slovenia is, <laughs> not comparable to, to a smaller city in the US. So yes, I guess it's much different. <laughs> yeah, if there's anything we can do from uh, PathCheck side, we have lots of you know, great team members and volunteers who can work with your team in Slovenia and make it available you know, kind of globally. It becomes kind of you know, a, a sandbox for great innovation. Uh, so we can, we can you know, give a lot of visibility on the, on the PathCheck website. Wonderful. And I think, uh, Ramesh, a very important point also made on the chat is that uh, about the strains that we were discussing. So I think it's Chitra who also said that um, the transmission chains and persistent infection are perhaps more likely explanations uh, than changes to the fundamental biology of the virus itself, which essentially brings us back to the point of creating solutions that influence behaviors and and um, and and how, key, how, how can we... Uh, really uh, design interventions that, that, that could work for the pandemic at the human level. And also that, that closely connects with the, uh, with the virus uh, level. So uh, Chitra, would you like to say something about that as well? And then perhaps that may be the last 
sort of comment and then ramesh can close the meeting well just is that i think that we need to combine uh, whatever we are learning from these epidemiological models uh, into what we are seeing in the real world together with how the virus is evolving so exactly what you said uh, we need we need to know what to do based on these data but we need to combine things thank you